Uh, good day, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, The Trends in the Structure Credit Markets, hosted by Quantify, a provider of risk analytics and trading solutions for the global capital markets. My name is Dmitry Pugachevsky, Director of Research at Quantify. Following the credit crisis of 2008, trench trading all but disappeared. But it's, it is now back, and with gusto. Uh, for example, bespoke trench trading reached 80 billion issuance in 2018 and continues to grow rapidly. All the far cry from pre-crisis levels are encouraging signs for the market's revival. Today we will talk about different aspects of trench trading and discuss its future prospects. Joining me as guest speakers, we have Kurt Kashnitsky, Executive Director, Structure Created Trading, Namura, and Gaurav Chejwani, Portfolio Manager with Brigade Capital Management. So we have the panel, which represents both buy side and sell sides, and both our speakers have many years of experience trading structured credit products. During the webinar, you will have an opportunity to post questions using the panel to the right of your screen. If we do not have time to answer all the questions, we'll provide an email response to your questions. Before the start, I would like to point out that the views and opinions expressed here are those of the individual and are not representative of their respective companies. Uh, without further ado, let me start with the discussion. In 2008, trading volume of index tranches reached 215 billion, while bespokes were only 80 billion. So, Gaurav, uh, let's start with you. What's your view on which tranches are more popular now, index or bespokes? Dimitri, thanks for the question and thanks to everyone who's, who's dialed in today. Um, so regarding the question on index tranches versus bespokes, needless to say in any market, liquid products always attract more, more trading volume, more attention. And in our market too, that is the case. Um, it has to do not just with liquidity or lower transaction costs, but also uh, with the transparency that comes along with uh, index tranches, transparency on pricing, transparency even on risks. For example, the exact deltas of the tranches or uh, other risk measures are, are well known. Also, what makes index tranches more popular is the ability to hedge either with single names or index or options on index. And for these reasons, index tranches, I think, will continue to stay more popular than, um, than bespoke tranches. Um, the other aspect which makes index tranches more popular is the ability to create unique, unique long short profiles. Now that's something that can be done in bespokes also, but it's much easier to create a structure such as long equity short mess tranche on the same exact portfolio, vice versa. So all in um, index tranches continue to be more popular. Um, that being said, there's only so much risk that investors would like to continue to take on the same 100 or 125 names over and over again. So there is a need for bespokes and we're starting to see liquidity in bespokes gradually improve. In addition, for the most part, we've been in an, in an environment where defaults have been few and far between. So as and when we see more trouble in certain certain names and people start developing very specific views on either certain sectors or certain names, we might start to see some more interest in bespoke tranches, relatively speaking. Okay, thanks, Gaurav. Uh, Kurt, uh, would you like to add uh, from the sell side point of view? Uh, hi, Dimitri. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I have very little to add. I think hands down, uh, the liquid tranches are, are more popular volume-wise. The one thing I'll add is um, from my seat, uh, you know, I see your the graph on the presentation there, the exponential growth. You know, I think that's also true in the bespoke uh, market. So um, at Nomura, our run rate, if you call it that, um, last year to this year uh, shows this growth trend continuing even in bespokes, especially if you take into account uh, some kind of CSO1 weighted uh, volume. Um, so sometimes the headline uh, volume numbers are down a little bit, um, but uh, that's because I, you know my volumes have uh, gone from purely two-year to split between two-year and five-year. But uh, I think 
while you know I, I, I don't expect the bespoke market to ever uh, approach the volumes of the index market in tranches, I, I do think the bespoke market will continue to exhibit the same uh, exponential growth. Okay, thanks, Kerr. Uh, let's talk about maturities now. Um, so, till recently, the most popular tenor was for bespoke was two years, but now uh, it seems like five year becomes more and more liquid. Uh, Kerr, do you think it's a stable trend, and how do you compare trading uh, two year versus five year? Uh, yeah, I think I think it is a stable trend. So, um, had you asked me at the beginning of this year, I would have said. Um, I would have I would have said five year was going to uh, eclipse two year even um, that that trend has leveled off um, uh, in my book somewhat but but my flows are still split um, when when I look at the trading that I do uh, certainly it's easier for me to find um, equity investors uh, in the two and two and a half year bucket um, clearly that's where it's easier for uh, credit pickers to have a uh, view on a name. Um, I also uh, see more trading. Uh, I, I've done a few bespoke shorts. Uh, those are in the shorter tenor buckets, as well as uh, almost uh, actually all of my secondary bespoke trading has been in the two and two and a half year bucket. So uh, that's alive and well. Um, five year, um, you know, that activity is is um, taken a breather, I guess, over, over the summer. Uh, I think absolute spread levels played into that, um, but that is the space where uh, I think there is more going on in terms of innovation. Uh, I know ourselves at Nomura and other banks have been working on uh, the first managed deals um, as as well as um, possibly looking at, at getting back into getting some of these tranches rated. So I think they're both gonna coexist. Um, um, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Gaurav, uh, from your point of view, uh, how do you compare twos and fives? Well, so the debate between two year and five year for someone on, on the buy side, um, you can argue either ways, as in the benefit of two year is, as Kurt said, that there is visibility on the likelihood of defaults on the portfolio. Um, but at the same time, the curves on many of the names are so steep that there has to be a price at which investors should be happy to switch from two years to five years. And I think the argument on defaults, fair as it may be, I think it, it applies quite, quite well to some of the distressed names. But when you look at good quality investment grade corporate um, entities, for example, a name trading at say 50 basis points or 100 basis points out to five years, I think it's very hard to make the argument that one can have visibility on default into two years, but not five years, because often such names, uh, if they default or become distressed, it's because of either either a fraud or some exogenous shock that no one saw coming. So I think the argument about defaults in itself, while it explains the greater amount of issuance in two years, can't alone explain it. And I think it has to do with asset liability mismatch. I think because bespokes are not necessarily seen as liquid enough to be easily able to get in and out. The fact that many participants feel like they have visibility on uh, on sufficient capital to a two-year horizon, either because they have locked up funding or because they have, uh, uh, they have uh, gates which prevent investors from immediately withdrawing money overnight. Whatever the reason may be, many investors feel they have um, they have the faith in being able to carry these trades for two years without being forced to unwind them. And I think that is an important, uh, in a, is an important determinant. But as we, as we go through, um, as we go through this, uh, this phase where five-year liquidity is starting to improve, um, I'm hoping that more and more players will look at the five-year tenor because there's, of course, a lot more interesting long-short trades that can be constructed when you go out to five years. With that I'll hand it back to you, Dimitri. Okay, uh, thanks, Gaurav. D Dimitri, well, one one more quick comment sure, uh, sure, on please, the back of what Gaurav please, just yeah. said. Um, he touched on something important, I think, uh, and part of it is part of what drives, I think, where where these deals are getting done are are the technicals in the market. Like the CDS market is again developing um, bespoke 
technicals, right? Uh, you know, so we had a couple two year deals ready to go and literally um, dealers were almost unwilling to bid two year CDS at that point. So, you know, the bespoke machine had been up and running for two years strong, um, you know, by this summer and uh, that bucket in their books, uh, you know, they were already, you know, very short. You know, I think that's part of what brought the five year um, into play. So I can, I continue to think, um, as as the bespoke machine comes back up to full hum, you know the the you know it's going to continue to drive dynamics in the in the single name market and where we're able to get deals issued and where it makes sense to get them issued, right? Um, because literally hedge costs became such a large part of two year deals for me that that it didn't make sense to do the deal, and that's part of what drove us to five years. Okay, thanks, Kurt. Uh, so we saw that uh, volumes in both index and uh, bespoke tranches uh, increase and uh, are increasing exponentially, but still there is the uh, feeling that there uh, there is some kind of a bottleneck for market increasing in size and the levels are far, far from uh, pre-crisis levels. So um, do we think, um, what's the reasons for this bottleneck? Uh, do market need more investors, more dealers, more liquidity in single names? Uh, Garaf, would you like to start? Uh, sure. I think uh, the question is really twofold. One is why do we have less players in bespoke than we have in index tranches. And the other is, why don't we have just more players in index tranches? And I think you have to separate the two questions out. Um, some of the factors for those two questions are the same and, and some are different. So I'll focus on the bespoke part of the equation since that's the, the question you asked first. And I would argue that the lack of single name liquidity, especially to two years, is probably the driving factor for that because that's not only does that mean that the cost of creating a new transaction is high, it also means for from the perspective of um, an investor, the cost of hedging it over time or the ability to unwind is lower. And I think till we have till we have good liquidity in two year or three year CDS, uh, that's going to be the case in terms of the bottleneck. Now, when it comes to index tranches in general, I think the reason we, we have less participants is partly because we've not had too much more volatility in the market, especially in terms of defaults. If you think of it, what the tranche market really does is it separates the spread and default component within the index such that the equity tranches take uh, a more leverage view on defaults while senior tranches are taking predominantly spread or mark-to-market risk. And as a result, if you have an environment like today where it defaults a few and far between, there aren't as many players who want to express those views through tranches. So those, I would think, are the, are the two primary factors. One additional factor, which is outside of, uh, outside of fundamentals, has to do with, with operational constraints and lack of data or analytics. So for example, if you want to trade a CLO, it's fairly straightforward. It's a QCIP. You have all the information available on Intex or Bloomberg, and you can go ahead and, and trade it. But in order to trade tranches, you require is does with multiple counterparties. And uh, and that's something which operationally is not easy for every buy side player involved. So that's one. The other is data on single names and all the nuances that go into pricing a tranche is not as easy to find in the public domain, or at least if you if you want high quality data, then there are a lot of costs associated with it. So I think that's another uh, that's another reason for the bottleneck. But you would hope that as uh, as time goes by, data gets easier and easier to access. I don't know if Kurt had any uh, any other uh, views on this question. I guess um, the couple things I guess I would add uh, that I see you know you know stop you know putting a check on growth is first uh since the rebirth of bespokes um in in the full capital structure trade you know the clients i talk to and ever and most in the marketplace this is less of a correlation product i would say and more of a levered credit product so i see fewer guys um trading bespoke tranches against you know delta on single names and things like this for a 
for a real correlation play and it's and it's just an absolute spread play so with that in mind the current credit environment and where where credit is it's it's too tight for some of those trades to make sense and it has made it um hard for me to place uh kind of junior mess right um so absolute credit spreads are in my way a little bit there um the other thing i would say that uh, clients mentioned to me um as a uh something that 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 gives them pause is just the underlying cds market um i know uh is this working on uh, on uh clarifying technical defaults and things like this i i think as that market gets cleaned up it 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 paves the way for more structured product on top of it, but I do think there are people on the sidelines, uh, you know, waiting for these, you know, highly tailored, um, high recovery defaults to be uh, eliminated. Um, and then finally, when I look at the market and and what what used to make the market work um, back when it started in the you know mid 2000s, you know, you had real money. Uh, players involved and and those guys are are largely missing from the market now um and to bring them back it's going to be uh with rated product again right um so i think that piece is is missing and and needs to be put in place before we get back to uh the volumes we once were okay uh thanks kurt um uh, Gaurav already mentioned clos and um uh I think there is the trend now again, kind of starting trend uh, of uh, CLO or ABS or other cash uh, traders um, entering um, trench market and uh, trying to hitch um, uh, basically their credit positions with uh, trenches. Uh, so um, how do we compare CSO versus CLO? Uh, Kurt, maybe uh, you can start and uh, uh, sure. talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is a this is a question that comes up a lot. I mean, first, yeah, I admit I'm I'm a CSO trader, but I also admit um, I think these two products are supposed to live together in in most you know structured credit books. You know, ha having said that, um, there's a lot of advantages to CSOs that that I like pointing out. You know, the biggest of which are um, the elimination of of warehousing risk. Um, you know, you can assemble. You know, as, as an equity investor, you can assemble your uh, portfolio um, and and ramp up in the matter of hours uh, to put your your view to work without changing market conditions uh, over over many months. Um, secondly, I always look at you know when you're comparing returns between um, a synthetic tranche and and a uh, CLO bond, you know I always uh, like like to bring up like leverage terms. So. Um, Rightly or wrongly, uh, you know, I've been down this uh, argument path many times. Rightly or wrongly, um, banks will extend far more credit, I found, uh, against synthetic tranches. Uh, you know, equity IAs, um, I've seen as low as, you know, 10%, 10 so uh, versus, you know, haircuts on, on CLO double Bs are are 40 percent sometimes uh so when you go through the analysis and looking looking at return especially you know levered adjusted returns uh certainly our market market appeals um the 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 final point i like uh talking to clo investors about is is the you know equity call option in, in clo structures i think a lot of times um that's mispriced um, in those deals. Um, and if you're if you're looking to invest in the senior part of the capital structure and you like where your risk is pricing, um, maybe the CSO market is is better for you, right? Uh, you're not going to get called out of that spread by the equity guy looking to refinance the deal when spreads tighten. Um, so again, I, I can't tell you how to price that option in the CLO market, but I just think a lot of times it's it's underpriced. So to me, those are the three three main um, advantages of, of, of CSOs as, as I see it currently. Uh, thanks, Kurt. Uh, Gaurav, uh, would you like to add? I think fundamentally as similar as the two products may be, the differences between the two, as in one being seen as a cash flow product and the other being seen as a derivative, is something that's not going to go away. If it didn't go away in 20 years, it's not going to go away in the next two or five years. And I think the participants will continue to be somewhat different. There will be, yes, some overlap, but I uh, I think despite the risks being somewhat similar, they will behave differently 
and you have to respect uh, the market and where things price. So you have to accept that this is how it's going to be. Now, they both have their own advantages and disadvantages. Um, synthetic tranches are significantly simpler in their structure, and the fact that they are typically static also makes them fairly easy to value. The complexity of CLOs makes them really hard to value mathematically, and that complexity is what actually makes the market, ironically enough, simple. That because it's hard to model them with precision, at best you can run certain scenarios and run certain stats on the underlying portfolio and then trade it based on certain thumb rules or look at where similar products traded in the past. And as long as that is the case, they will behave very differently. I think one key risk from the perspective of, of an investor is the mark-to-market behavior. CLOs uh, don't move on a day-to-day -day basis because cash flows don't change on a day-to-day -day basis and therefore give you the impression of more stability. CSOs, on the other hand, because they're priced based on a model, jump around every day. Now, some people will argue that they capture more noise than true signal, and that's a matter of personal opinion. But the fact is, on a daily basis, they are trying to, um, they're trying to capture the information as indicated by the single name credit default swap market. And therefore, from an investor's point of view, CLOs will always appear to have a higher Sharpe ratio than CSOs. Of course, for large moves, um, it wouldn't matter because eventually um, fundamentals catch up with any product irrespective of what kind of method you use to mark them. And I think the fact that there is more price stability in CLOs uh, is an important aspect of the market. Also, the fact that CLOs are, are rated changes the whole dynamic. So from, from an investor's point of view, there's nothing right or wrong. This is, this is how the market is. And at certain points in the market, uh, in the market, you'll find one to be cheaper or more attractive than the other, and certain points of time, you'll you'll find one to be a better short, especially on the CSO side. I, I guess it's hard to short CLOs, um, but yeah, I mean that's the structure of the market, and uh, from the uh, from the investor's perspective, that's that's what makes uh, makes our jobs interesting or exciting, because um, it's a portfolio manager or trader's uh, job to to compare two similar products that trade very differently and price very differently. Okay, thank you, Gaurav. Yeah, actually, I would like to continue uh, this um, idea of uh, shortening CSOs, right? Um, so you can do this, uh, and uh, you, uh, which is very hard to do with CLOs or impossible. So, uh, Gaurav, can you tell us more about aspects of uh, short trading uh, for CSOs? So I think the uh, the question on being able to sh to short risk is as much valid for index tranches as it is for for bespokes. But you have to keep in mind that the majority of trading is from the long risk side, and the short risk side is not common. And yet it's common enough that if you if you discuss the possibility of going short risk in in bespokes, it doesn't surprise anyone. Now. That being said, even within the shorts, I think a good fraction of those shorts are in a long short format. For example, an investor may want to go long equity risk and short them as a vice versa. Or they may want to do some kind of a curve trade where they could go long and short somewhat similar portfolios in different maturities. Um, it, is, it, is, it is an interesting way for people to create a profile of, of defaults. So if you think of tranches the form of option instead of just being long the equity tranche, which which is like long a call option, you can create structures like call spreads or one by two calls or calendars and so on. The same option like jargon can be used in tranches to create these profiles. Uh, but uh, I have seen some instances where people have used bespokes as a true outright short, not just not just to hedge. Uh, along in another tranche or an index tranche, but truly to hedge their portfolio. Anecdotally, we've you know, we've seen some instances of that. Now, often you may not know what that investor is trying to do. Are they truly just bearish on the market and think, think that names will default? Or do they have other longs in their portfolio that they think can be can be hedged, especially against defaults using, using certain uh, bespoke tranches? But I think the fact that you can go both long and short is not just 
a good tool to have in the toolkit. I think the other purpose that it serves, and which is a very important aspect, is it keeps the overall pricing in the market very honest. It ensures that products cannot just trade extremely rich or 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 cheap to fair value because there's a price at which irrespective of what the cost of capital or, or, or the transaction cost may be, there's a price at which certain market participants might come in and take the other side of the trade. And to me, that makes it quite exciting. That's a very interesting point. Uh, Kurt, would you like to add anything on this? Uh, no, I, I agree with what uh, Gaurav said. I've seen um, both types of uh, short credit flows uh, in bespoke. Um, the the one thing I'd like to point out for um, the participants on the call, and I and I caution this uh, to everyone, it is a great tool for constructing short um, a, a short view on a sector, for example, and things like that. I always caution uh, on liquidity, right? Um, I think it's yet to be proven that you'll be able to monetize a short uh, in a bespoke tranche. Um, that that that's my one caution. Um, the other uh, point that Garov uh, hint, hinted around that I that I wanted to uh, touch on is I think CSOs offer the offer the opportunity to build um, short uh, trading structures from going long the tranche right so because all the other underlyings of a bespoke um, tranche are are liquid you can certainly put together strategies uh, on your delta hedges that trade net short and and I've seen that a lot and I think that's a very or can be a very successful trading strategy okay uh, thank you um, so uh, uh, dealers uh, try to uh, when uh, trading bespokes right they try to uh, trade the whole uh, capital structure to find uh, investors for uh, all the uh, tranches in the capital structure or so we are told uh, so uh, Kurt can you maybe start discussion or how um, uh, dealers are willing to trade non-full capital structure uh, certainly, I think de I actually think dealers' ability across the street varies uh, on this topic. Uh, I will say uh, Nomura's on the uh, what I view to be the quite quite conservative end. So um, uh, my capital charge is very punitive uh, if I leave open part of the capital structure. So um, just as a matter of uh, trading with Nomura, you know, largely I have to have I have to have the equity tranche placed. Um, certainly everywhere through expected losses. Um, I, you know, I can leave a gap in the, in the mezz or senior um, for a few weeks while I place that because uh, the, the pipeline there is quite strong and we're confident we, we can place that. Uh, I've heard um, empirically from my trading partners that uh, there's other counterparties on the street that are, have far more flexibility in terms of that. Um, so may, maybe Gaurav uh, has has more experience with that. Um, I will say I, I believe that ability of some of my counterparts at other banks to trade open capital structures, if you will, led to a little bit of a glut um, in terms of MES or junior MES uh, through the summer that is still um, waiting to go through, if you will. Um, uh, Gaurav, uh, do you have any comments on that? Well, I think um, someone like you, who's uh, who's on the sell side, is is better uh, equipped to handle a question on what is punitive from a regulatory st standpoint and what is not. Um, we get to see snippets of it on on the buy side as as we get shown deals from from different uh, different dealers on the street. All I would say is that it doesn't look like we'll see too many of the single tranche bespokes that used to be issued pre-2008. Regulation is punitive, punitive enough that um, banks, of course, try to place the full cap structure, but in case they don't, don't, it's not because they want to warehouse certain risk forever or take that as a proposition. It's probably because they felt that trying to place all the tranches in the same exact day, um, the execution, they can get that way versus occasionally holding on to one or two slices and waiting for a week or two or a month to place it on a later date at hopefully a better level. That's that's a risk they're taking in the syndication process and sometimes they will do that. But that's very different 
because in place not placing one part of the cap structure is very different from the old days where the entire deal involves just placing one tranche. And I think that's a decision the, the structurers at the bank have to take as to whether the ability to place it in the future at a much better level is worth the risk and the capital charges involved. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. The, the days of uh, single you know, r rated uh, junior mezz issuance, single tranche deals are done uh, as near as I can tell. My ca the capital's way too expensive for that for me. Um, but yeah, Gaurav summed it up exactly right. Uh, we will hold a senior part of the capital structure if we believe um, we can get better execution in the future, or if we're happy at the price where we're left that piece uh, as a, uh, you know, uh, short to medium term view. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, interesting recent development was that uh, high yield tranches are now uh, quoted upfront with the same running uh, 500 coupon. So um, I don't know, maybe Kurt, you will start. Uh, do you think it's a positive development uh, is that uh, brings more liquidity to the market? Uh, does it increase risk or decrease them? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a a positive uh, move for the market. Um, Nomura does not trade in index tranches, so I'm not in the trenches and can't comment on that, but the analogy to the bespoke market, I think is good. Um, I've I've talked to counterparties and, and continue to do so about doing a similar structure um, in the bespoke, because obviously if I can strike all my tranches at, uh, you know, K equals, 100, for example, and get my hedges off at K equals 100, um, I'm not left with this annuity risk that's built up in dealers' bespoke books over time. Um, and in theory, that I, you know, I've argued uh, to counterparties that, that that will get them more, both more liquidity and better execution versus mid, uh, if they're willing to trade like that in, in the bespoke tranche. So uh, I have to imagine um, this this helps everything in the liquid world, you know, all the replication trades, uh, elim you know, you've eliminated coupon risks, uh, et cetera. I think it's uh, only a good thing. Uh, Gaurav, uh, have the same opinion? I think standardizing coupons uh, on average is, is better for the market. I think the same applies at the index and single name level. If all the single names in the index have the same exact coupon, then index arbitrage is much cleaner. You're not left with timing of default risk on a particular name. Uh, the same is true for tranches. If all the tranches within an index have the same exact coupon, then you can create near perfect arbitrage in the tranches. And if you go long all the tranches and short the index or vice versa, you're not left with second order risks such as um, the exact timing of default and that could that could make it harder to run that arbitrage. And therefore, it's good for the market, keeps the markets more efficient and more liquid. Now, of course, it does create problems for those tranches that trade far from the stated coupon. Now, equity tranche investors are used to seeing low dollar prices, like 50 cents on the dollar, but it becomes rather nuanced for a super senior. So for example, high yield super senior on the run tends to trade at, let's say, 30 basis points. and with a 500 coupon, we're talking about dollar prices of 19 points upfront the other way. So if you want to think of it like a bond, it's like a bond trading at 119 or $120 price. Now that creates second order interest rate or other risks to the tranche holder. And some people may not want to take those risks, but I think, I think um, these second order risks that are created are minor inconveniences relative to what it provides to the market, which is a lot more efficiency through the, the, the cleaner arbitrage situation between single names and index, index and tranches. So overall, I'm a proponent of, uh, of fixing coupons. Okay, thank you. Uh, and before we go to the Q&A, maybe uh, the last question about a kind of a future prospect for the market. Uh, do you think uh, we will see a rating for tranches anytime soon at all? Uh, Kurt, uh, what's your opinion? Yeah, I've already hinted on that. I think that's in the works at, at many banks. Um, 
you know, uh, from my point of view, that's a probably middle next year type thing by the time that gets all hammered out. Um, prior to that, I, I think the more um, uh, imminent in, innovation is is the, is managed deals coming to this folks. I think that's uh, in the short term. Uh, Gaurav? Yeah, so this is one part of the market that I personally uh, find a little annoying, which is the obvious first step would be to have index tranches rated, because if you can have in index tranches rated, which is the most liquid product within the tranche market, then you can you can get new types of strategies or new types of players involved in the market. But then the question is, who pays for it? Because when you have a bespoke tranche, it's fairly straightforward. Here are the three or four issuers, uh, three or four investors who are involved in this deal, and here's the bank that's structuring it. So you can you can tag a cost, whatever it is, and go and pay Moody's or S&P or Fitch to to provide a rating on that tranche. But when it comes to index tranches, it is a fair question to ask who should pay for it. There are so many participants, there's so many dealers, and then there are, um, there are other third parties involved. Um, and it is annoying in, in the sense, yeah, there's no clear answer. And, and therefore, ironic as it may be, the product that is the most liquid and the most transparent out there might might be the last one to get rated. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are now going into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder, then you can uh, type uh, any questions. Uh, in the next 10-15 uh, minutes, we will try to answer all of them. If uh, we don't have time, we run out of time, then uh, we will uh, answer this in email. So we already got a couple of questions, and uh, let's start uh, with, uh, uh, with this one. Uh, are there still incentives for banks to issue CLOs in times of low interest rate and increased tranche risk weights? And uh, reference to a Basel BCBS 374. Uh, it seems like a bank question, so Kurt, I will uh, address to you. Uh, sure. I mean, I know I noticed the questions on CLOs. To be clear, uh, I'm not directly involved in you know Nomura's CLO trading effort, but um, given that the whole uh, capital structure is being placed from the bank, I can't see that risk weights uh, make much of an impact on this, um, and that's very similar to my market. Um, the the risk risk weighted capital against tranches don't don't come into play much for me as I I close out all my capital structures within a few weeks. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, another question uh, which we got is: Are bespoke portfolios across dealers or deals very similar? Uh, Gaurav, would you like to answer? Um, yes, I would say there is a significant amount of overlap in the names that we see in bespokes. Of course, not every deal will have the same exact names, but uh, there is a fair amount of overlap. And um, and we wonder why that is, and I think uh, there are a couple of reasons. I think the primary reason is that because if issuance is, is, is mostly in the two-year to three-year part of the, of the curve, you're forced to pick names that have liquidity out to two years. And while at the five-year point, there might be many market participants that are willing to buy or sell protection on a name. At the two-year point, number of buyers of protection is limited because often at the two-year point, buyer of protection is looking to hedge for defaults rather than just for spread moves. And that limits the number of names that are available. And the other aspect I'm guessing is that the number of participants involved in the equity tranche is, is a handful, let's say, half a dozen, maybe a dozen at best. And if that is the case, there might be a certain set of names that they're comfortable um, underwriting and, and taking default risk on. And as a result, the number of names that show up in, in the portfolios is, is, is limited. So as a, one of the reasons for having this book is the ability to go outside of the names within the index and hence have a more diversified exposure, both from the long and the short side. While these folks are serving that purpose, um, unfortunately, it's not as expanded as it should be. Um, I'll add, yeah, Gaurav is absolutely yeah, correct please. there. The, the, sorry? Yeah, yeah, please, Kurt. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, Gaurav is absolutely correct there. The, the one thing I'll add is from a macro perspective, these portfolios, from my view, all look similar. They, 
um, you know, similar DWAS, et cetera, like this, and 80, 85% of the portfolio is the same, but you do see significant differences in the, you know, 15 or 20% that I, I'll say drive the value of the bespoke or, or add most of the spread, et cetera, that, you know, I do see my equity counterparties um, varying quite a bit on that. Uh, you know, there'll be different heavy sector concentrations in that 15 to 20% of high yield names. But broadly, the, the, the remaining 80 plus names that fell out the portfolio end up being selected for the criteria Gorov mentioned, liquidity, et cetera, and it ends up being the same names. Yeah, I think my overall observation is that um, you tend to see the widest names in the IG universe and the tighter names in the high yield universe. I think Absolutely. names that trade at say, 10 or 20 basis points, no one has the incentive to put them in a portfolio because they don't have enough juice or spread, while the most distressed names um, might uh, might not be something that some of the investor up the stack might want, even if the equity tranche holder is comfortable with it. So at the end of the day, you land up with the best names in high yield and the worst names in IG. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next couple of questions are about the volume of trading. Uh, one is, uh, what is the overall volume of index and bespoke tranches uh, comparing to the pre-financial crisis? Uh, so we know like last year number 85 for bespoke, 215 for um, index, right? Um, uh, Gaurav or uh, Kurt, do you remember pre-crisis levels? Uh, can you comment on comparison with pre-crisis? Uh, this is Kurt. I, I can't remember exact pre-crisis volumes, but the comparison in my mind is is almost almost not valid. Uh, you know, when I was trading bespoke in 04, 05, 06, 07, it was all single tranche issued deals. Um, so comparing those volumes to today's fully fully placed volumes, I don't think makes much sense. Certainly. Um, I'm not doing as many deals um, in, c currently, um, but I, I, I'll say you know the the, the growth trend is alive, right? Um, we're definitely going to have year over year um, increased volume, uh, especially on on a you know CSO one weighted basis. Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, but, think, but yeah. today's full I capital Kurt, structure is like. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, I think Kurt's absolutely right. Now, if you look at pre-crisis, most of the issuance volumes that people measured were based on the rated deals because that was the easily publicly available information as to how much got rated. Many of the unrated transactions that were done in swap form were not necessarily tracked as, as cleanly. Now, um, at that time, order of magnitude, the issuance looked similar in CLOs and bespoke. So order of magnitude was 100 billion in each and kept growing in bespokes. But what Kurt said is a very important point that that doesn't tell you much. And that doesn't tell you much because the typical issuance then involved thin bespokes. So let's say a two to 3% slice or a three to 5% slice on a five year or a seven year or a 10 year uh, part of the trend. So in terms of notionals, the order of magnitude might look the same today but in terms of the average delta, well, by definition, if you're placing the entire cap structure right now, the average delta is one. In those days, the average delta was, let's say, three or four, if not higher, maybe even five. Then on top of that, you adjust for the duration, and the volumes then, risk adjusted, were probably at least 10 times bigger, if not more. So it's very hard to compare those two, um, but I think that minimum ratio of 10 that I just uh, came up with back of the envelope is probably on the conservative side. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next question is also about volumes, but um, uh, of secondary market. So some dealers took up the number of secondary market bespoke deals that they see. What volumes do you see in the secondary market for bespokes and is it reasonably priced? Uh, Kurt, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, largely, my secondary volume is um, senior tranches that have rolled down, and the investors, uh, you know, no longer has the, you know, return for the capital required to hold that, uh, so they trade out of it. And and the execution is is pretty good actually, because um, 
you know, there's plenty of players willing to to take the short dated uh, senior coupons, uh, presumably to fund other trades that they like. So uh, that's a that's a highlight of the bespoke market liquidity, uh, I would say. Uh, Gaurav, uh, would you like to? Add? Well, we'll all have our biases when we answer that question. Kurt said liquidity is good because he sits on the sell side, and if you ask anyone on the buy side, they will say that secondary liquidity is not that great, and we have those inherent biases. But the fact is that if secondary transactions take place, that means buyer and a seller agree, agreed to transact at that price, whether they liked it or not, they, they did the transaction, which means it was a fair price, which means the liquidity was acceptable to both sides, given the market environment at that point in time. Uh, and there can be uh, no excuses around it. If you, if you, if you trade it, that was, that was fair price. And a better question to ask is what percent of bespokes that are issued land up being held to maturity versus what percent are unwound versus what percent are novated. And sitting on the buy side, it's harder for me to have that information precisely. Um, maybe some of the active participants on the sell side have, have better sense. I can just take a guess. My guess is um, at least two thirds, if not more, are held to maturity. So. Um, especially on the equity part of the of the cap structure. It's possible that some of the MES does transact in the secondary market. And as far as novation is concerned, yes, it can be done. Nothing stops a person from novating. But more often than not, the original counterparty has the best price because they know the portfolio and the other players in that, uh, in that exact transaction. Um, that being said, novations do happen. And um, I've seen it multiple times over the last few years. My guess is less than a quarter of the deals get novated. The remaining, if they are traded, are back with the original counterparty. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is about structure of trading. Uh, what formats of risk usually trade in the bespoke market? Uh, for example, if index market has K equal 100, how does bespoke trade? Kurt, I think this is uh, for you to start. Sure. Um... You know, bespoke is bespoke. Uh, you know, already we see all the risk formats coming back from from pre-crisis. Um, the the uh, most, I would say, all the recent equity I've traded has traded at least part of the deal in uh, PO principal only format on the equity. Um, almost always, equity investor has uh, convexity in mind, and in, in the low dollar price. Uh, long equity is is the trade they want to get into. Uh, we've also traded all running spread equity, um, and and the standard, if you will, uh, strike 500 equity. Um, I would yeah, I would say all those are um, PO is is probably the the largest bid offer uh, simply because that leaves me as a dealer with the largest uh, coupon annuity risk, but certainly um, it isn't a hindrance to getting a deal done uh, and we, we will trade all all the formats. Um, for the balance of the capital structure, um, I'm just thinking back, I think I think all the junior mess uh, I've traded is, is strike 100 and super senior, I largely trade, um, you know, uh, uh, just a fair spread. So, uh, not 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 a standardized coupon on that. Uh, Gaurav, would you like to add? Actually, Kurt answered pretty much everything, so I don't have anything to add to that. Okay, uh, we have time uh, for one uh, question, last last question, and uh, this is good about the future of the uh, market development. And uh, uh, what is the barrier to entry for new players? What does one need to start trading these products? So, uh, Graf, uh, can we start with you? I think uh, the biggest barrier to entry is is the ability to have is does. And that means there's a certain size below which one cannot trade the product. And it rules out a fairly large number of investors in the market. And even if you have organizations that have the ability to do it, uh, if they have smaller funds or separately managed accounts, then unless they're a certain size, it may not be worth the time and effort involved in, in signing is does. Um, and that I think is is the biggest bottleneck. Um, 
The next bottleneck above that is is the question of complexity that often gets attached to the product, uh, whether fair or not. One of the simpler products in terms of cash flows is seen as more complex than than a cash flow structured product like a CLO, and that's the way it has been. And therefore, for now, it's seen as as complex. I think many organizations are nervous about being involved in complex derivatives. When you combine the word structured and derivative and complex, it just uh, raises the hurdle. And last but not the least, I think there is um, there's dearth of of publicly available high quality data on on tranches, on single names, etc. You can probably acquire some of that data, but it is expensive. And I think that'll continue to be a, a bottleneck. Uh, Kurt, uh, would you like to add? No, I just want to say I really like Gaurav's point around the comparative complexities between CSOs and CLOs. Uh, I think that's, uh, I, I think that one warrants more thought because uh, I agree with his views. Uh, in, in my mind, the CSO is the simpler cash flow product. Um, yet many organizations uh, get get caught up in in uh, modeling complexities around it, uh, etc. But uh, other than that, well answered by Gaurav, I would say. Actually, we got one more question, and I think we have a couple of minutes to answer it. Uh, can you speak to the price sensitivity of index trades in current rate market, uh, uh, i.e. the increased prepayment risk? Uh, Kurt, can you? Well, again, uh, we don't we don't uh or i don't trade index tranches so uh i don't have too much uh opinion on that one i, I don't see you know i haven't seen how flows have been impacted by rates uh on those products uh then Gaurav, can you answer this yeah i usually think of prepayment risk etc et related more to consumer risk rather than rather than clos or um or bespokes. I mean, they could be second order risks from interest rates, but for the most part, we talk about corporate credit risk, default risk, and we're talking about floating rate product or effectively floating rate products. It's not something that we spend too much time on with respect to this this particular uh, part of the market. Okay. Agreed. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, there is one question about can we share the presentation slides, but I will address this to uh, our organizers. I think we answered all the questions, and I think, honestly, this is all the time we have. Um, so a recording of this webinar will be available in the coming days. And uh, thank you very much, Kurt and Gaurav, for your time today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed the webinar, and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.